Hi guys, today's topic is gonna to be plant reproduction. And so this is how does an adult plant make new baby plants, essentially. Um, just as a little aside, you may note at some point during the lecture, my lights are probably gonna go off. I'm sitting in my classroom alone, socially distanced. And if I'm not up and moving the auto timer for you know the environmental whole thing, we'll shut the lights off. And so we'll just keep going, no pause. We gotta learn this information. Today's topic, again, plant reproduction. Before we get to plant reproduction, we need to talk about the two main categories of plants because it really does kind of differentiate how they're gonna reproduce a little bit. Um, I've seen on the IB exam that they give you a picture of a plant or they give you this list of characteristics and they ask you to identify this plant as monocot or dicot. So you really do need to understand this. There goes the lights. All right, a dicot flower or plant. Um, an example of this is a sunflower. And when you plant the seed, when it first comes up out of the ground, there's leaves that are gonna appear. If one leaf appears, it's a monocot, mono meaning one. If two leaves appear, it's a dicot, di meaning two. And so a dicot plant, like a sunflower, when you first plant the seed, the first thing that comes up and splits, you get two leaves off of that, so it's a dicot. Um, another way, if you can't see this plant when it first develops, that you can identify it as a dicot, is that it's going to have big leaves, and on those leaves, you're going to have a central vein, and then lots of veins branching off of it. Um, you're going to have branched roots. So if you were to like yank this plant off the ground, it's not going to be one skinny long root going down, it's going to be a bunch of branched roots. If you see just the flower, those flowers are gonna have petals in groups of fours or fives. And so if you look at this flower right here, it's got one, two, three, four, five petals. That's a dicot. If you are to cut the stem in half, it's vascular bundles, it's xylem and it's phloem are going to be in rings around a central core. And it's gonna have a main tap root, one thick, thick root that goes down deep with branching roots coming off of it. A monocot, again, when you first plant this seed and it comes up out of the ground, it's gonna have one leaf, mono meaning one. If you um, look at the leaves of this plant, it's usually gonna be a skinny leaf and the veins are gonna run parallel. Your dicots are the flowers that you buy in the flower store. Your monocots tend to be grass. Um, it has unbranched roots. You pull it out of the ground, it's just one skinny root. And the flowers are gonna be, have petals in groups of three. So if you look at this one, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six. So a multiple of three. And the vascular system is gonna be scattered throughout the central core of the plant. Again, just another way of looking at this, um, these are all dicots. And so in here, you've got two seed leaves. You've got four, multiples of four or five in its flower parts on the leaf one central vein and then branching parts um, and then your vascular bundles are in a circle around as opposed to a monocot where you have one seed leaf you have your flower parts and multiples of three all of your veins on your leaf are going to run parallel and your vascular bundles are going to be distributed throughout the stem you guys are going to at some point going to be asked to identify the different parts of a flower and you're gonna be asked to pick a flower out of your neighbor's yard and dissect it and then kind of put these out and label them so that you get used to it. You also need to be able to draw it. IB is famous for asking you to draw stuff. And so a question that could be four points is, draw a dicot flower and you have to label all of these parts. Um, the different parts, the sepal. The sepal is the green leaves at the base of the flower. So if you can see where my pointer is going. So it's the leaves that are underneath the flower. These are for protection. Before this buds out into a flower, the sepal leaves are gonna close around it and then it's gonna open to kind of display all of the reproductive organs, which is what a flower is. The petals, the bright colors are there to attract pollinators. The anther is the male part. So the anther is this part here and it's gonna have on that pollen. Now, some plants are gonna have male and female parts on their flower, and some plants will have male flowers and female flowers. You can even have a fully male plant and a fully female plant. But this plant right here has mixed male and female. So the anther is gonna have pollen, 
the filament supports the anther. You want the anther up high because you want your bees or your other insects to come and collect that pollen so that it can be then moved over to the female part. The stigma is the sticky part here, where right here, where the pollen's gonna land and it's gonna stick there. Um, the style supports this carpal. Um, the ovary is the base, that thick part down here, and that's where the eggs are gonna develop. These eggs actually develop into the fruit and into the seed. Uh, the pistil is this whole thing, the stigma, the style, and the ovary together. And the stamen is the filament and the anther together. So the stamen is the male part, the pistil is the female part. When you have pollination, you're going to have pollination by animals. You can have pollination by wind. Pollination is essentially the movement of the pollen into the female parts of the plant. You could have self-pollination. The pollen comes from another plant or the same flower. Um, it's going to limit genetic diversity. So if you go back to that flower from the last side, if the pollen from that flower is going to pollinate that same flower, you can have fruit and you can have baby plants at that point, but your genetic diversity isn't gonna be there. They're gonna be close to clones, not clones, but very close to it. Cross-pollination comes from another plant of the same species. It can also come from a closely related species. So I've got grapefruit plants in my backyard and they're two different species of grapefruit plant, but they can pollinate each other. Having those two different species helps increase diversity within the plant of the genetics and therefore increases the health of the plant and increases the fruiting of the plant. Pollination is done by insects, animals, or wind. Um, grasses are often wind pollinated and that's why your allergies are really bad because all of that pollen picks up in the wind of the grasses and the idea is that the wind's going to move it to the next grass. Unfortunately, sometimes it moves it into our noses. Um, dicots are usually animal pollinated um, and if it's got red flowers, it's often pollinated by birds. In our area, hummingbirds are huge pollinators. If it's yellow and orange, it tends to be pollinated by bees. And this is why if you are allergic to bees or you have a phobia of bees, you probably shouldn't go hiking in a yellow shirt because the bees are gonna think you're a flower. They're not the smartest organisms. And then if it's white or scented, it's gonna have nocturnal. So bats can actually pick up on the scents of these flowers. Moths, things that are flying around at night are going to pollinate anything that's got like a white petal. Insect pollinated plants produce a nectar. This nectar is high in sugar. Um, plants that are done by hummingbirds also produce a nectar. That's why if you want hummingbirds in your backyard, you could put like the sugar out there and the hummingbirds are gonna come. The bees will come for it as well because that's one of the things that entices them to the flowers. The flowers have developed this to get the bees and the hummingbirds to come over so that they get the pollen on them and then the pollen gets transferred so that it can go down the pollen tube. And if you look here, um, this talks a little bit about the different ways that a bee is cross-pollinating. So he comes to this flower and the pollen sticks to the base of him and he goes over and when he comes to this flower, he then transfers that pollen to the secondary flower. If you look here, this talks about the different things that can pollinate, again, and the types. We can have artificial pollination, by the way. I can go out in my backyard and move pollen from one plant to another with a Q-tip. Um, theory of knowledge moment. One of the big things that we talk about in this class and in environmental science is the fact that the hummingbees are on a decline and that we need hummingbees. 90% of the food that you are eating is pollinated by bees. And we have seen what's called um, colony collapse disorder where our hives are just falling apart. The farmer goes out and there's no bees in that hive anymore. Um, or they find all the bees on the ground dead around that. Um, one of the things that we think is happening is that there is a parasite carrying honeybee from Australia that's come in and that parasite then infects the hive. We also think that pesticides are doing it um, or just stress because a lot of our bees for the farmers are moved long distance. And so if you're a farmer, you can actually rent bees and they ship those bees in. They put the hives in your um, orchard for the time that your orchard's got flowers and then they will come pick up those bees and move them somewhere else. Again, parasites could be there. 
And then the idea of poor nutrition. So as we've gotten to monoculture, as you go through the Midwest and you see nothing but cornfields, your bees are now eating only one type of nectar. And that isn't good, just like it's not good if you were to only eat Cheetos. These bees are eating only essentially corn syrup or corn nectar, and that's not good for them. They need a variety in their diet. Um, one of the things that we talk about is how can we increase the diet of our bees if monoculture is a problem. And so here are all the different plants that you can plant in your backyard to attract honey. honey. Wow, let me see that again. Here are all the different plants you can plant in your backyard to attract bees to help them out. Okay, process of fertilization. This could be an essay question. They could ask you, list the steps, list and describe the steps of fertilization. So the first thing that's gonna happen or needs to happen is that the male and female gametes form a zygote. So the pollen and the egg come together and form a zygote, form a baby. So we get the pollen transferred to the style of the ovum and that pollen actually stays up on top and it makes a pollen tube that goes all the way down to the ovary. The nucleus then transfers down that pollen tube down into the egg. We need two male pollen nuclei in order to get a seed to form. One forms the zygote, the baby, and one forms all of the starch and the food that that seed needs to develop. Um, the seed is actually the baby. The seed's what's going to go into the ground and grow and make us a new plant. There are a couple of parts to a seed that you need to know. The testa is the outer covering of that seed, and it protects that seed from germinating at the wrong time. The cotyledons are the seed leaves. These are the first leaves that are going to pop up out of the ground. The micropyle is the scar from the pollen tube. So it's gonna be like a little difference in coloring or maybe texture on that seed. And then the embryo is where the root is that goes down into the ground and the shoot that's gonna come out with the cotyledons attached. The seed is often dehydrated, it's dormant. In the right conditions, we can store these seeds for millennia. Um, and this is the idea behind the seed banks that for all of the plants in the global world, we want to have some seeds. So if we have, say, a nuclear winter, we can go in and replant all of the plants that we have. So why dormancy? Dormancy prevents the seed from growing in conditions that aren't ripe for that plant. We want this plant to have the best chance at life. And so it has to grow at the right time of year. You know, a seed that germinates in the winter in the snow isn't going to make it. We want it to be in the right place. We want it to have the right soil. So a seed that's dropped on concrete isn't gonna make it. And we want the seed really to be transported away from the parent plant because otherwise they're gonna fight for resources. Most seeds don't germinate as soon as they're dispersed, which means as soon as they fall into the ground. There is incomplete seed development. The embryo is immature and it has to mature during this dormancy period. In other words, it has to age. It has to get to a certain age. In that aging process, you have to have the right conditions. So there's a lot of plants that have to winter. So in California, if we want like the paper whites to bloom at Christmas time, we have to take that bulb, which is the seed for that plant, and put it in the refrigerator so it gets the right conditions before it will germinate. There is a plant growth regulator within the seed called gibberellic acid. This inhibits development, and as time goes on, it diminishes, it breaks down. And so you need the gibberellic acid to be completely gone before, or almost completely gone before this plant uh, germinates. We have an impervious seed coat. These seeds are hard and you need water and oxygen to make it into the seed for germination. And so this impervious seed coat prevents that. And again, that will break down over time. That ensures that the seed ages to the proper age. Um, and we need the requirement for pre-chilling. A lot of our seeds have to overwinter before they're going to develop. Germination occurs under the right conditions. And these white, right conditions are you have to have water. So there has to be enough water for the seed to fully hydrate. This is an enzymatic process. And so you need these enzymes to have water because water is the basis for all biological chemistry. You have to have oxygen. It has to be present for aerobic respiration. 
this plant doesn't have leaves yet. So it has to get its energy somehow. And it's going to get that energy by breaking down the starch in the seed through aerobic respiration. And you have to have the right temperatures because this is an enzymatic process. And so when you talk about aerobic respiration, there's a lot of enzymes involved. When you talk about germination, there's a lot of enzymes involved. And so you have to have the right conditions for those enzymes to be at their optimal condition for them to work. This is just an image. Please take the time to look at it. It talks about the process in nice picture form. Okay, metabolic process for germination. This is a test question on my tests every single year, and I see it every other, every third year on the IB exam. So germination is a resumption of growth and the development for the seed to form. First thing that happens, water makes it into the seed and it activates the enzymes needed for germination. Once the water has been absorbed, the plant is going to produce a growth hormone called gibberellin. Then amylase, another enzyme, is going to break starch down into maltose. Guys, that step starch to maltose, that's a point. Make sure you've got it down. Maltose is then used in cellular respiration, and it's also used to make cellulose so that the cell has the structural support. Stored proteins and lipids are hydrolyzed. That's why you need water. Amino acids are used to make new proteins. Fatty acids and glycerols are used in cell membranes as the plant grows. Okay, let's assume that our plant got planted in the right spot. It grew, now we need it to reproduce again. How are we gonna control the flowering of this plant? Because it does no good for the plant to flower if the pollinators aren't present or if the temperature is not right or the conditions aren't favorable. So the main factor affecting flowering is daylight. Now we live in a weird part of the world where we don't have a lot of difference between the winter and the summer as far as the amount of daylight, but picture yourself living in New York. In New York, in the summer, it could be daylight until eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night. And in the winter, it gets dark at like three. And so that difference is a kind of indication to the plant of when to flower. Because we've got pretty much equal sunlight and daylight, that's the same thing, and nighttime, um, we can get plants to flower year round pretty much in Southern California. The response of the plant to changes in length of day is photomorphogenesis. So photo's light, morpho is like a change in the plant, and genesis is a growth. So we're talking about this change to grow flowers. Phytochrome is a pigment that's in the plants in low concentrations. It's highly reactive and comes in two forms, PR and PFR. PR is the inactive form and it's absorbing red light and it changes to the active form quickly. PFR is the active form. It absorbs far red light and changes back to the inactive form. It's a slow process. The presence of PFR causes flowering. We have two types of plants, short day plants and long day plants. Short day plants flower only if the period of darkness is longer than a critical point. So you have to have a long enough night to trigger flowering. Even a brief flash of light will stop flowering. So if you're growing plants in a greenhouse, they'll actually have them dark for the amount of time needed to get a flower because in California, one of our main exports is actually flowers. And so we're gonna grow these artificially. And so in a greenhouse, they'll keep it dark long enough to get this plant to flower. If someone accidentally turns on the lights during the dark period, it will ruin the entire crop. So PFR acts as an inhibitor and only long periods of darkness will allow the levels of PFR to drop low enough to allow flowering. And an example here is a spinach or a radish. Long day plants will flower only if the period of darkness is shorter than a critical plant. Um, think about, again, that idea that in the Northeast, we have really short nights, that the amount of daylight goes until 10 o'clock at night. That's prime for these long day plants. So they need a short night and a long day in order to flower. So PFR promotes flowering in these plants. A long period of light allows PFR to accumulate and therefore allow flowering. Okay, crash course, guys, watch it. Hank is our best friend. He will help you learn this stuff. 
Um, it will help you review things that maybe you missed in my lecture. All right, see you next time.